Lori Houts. Lori Ann Houts was born in Las Vegas, Nevada on February 6, 1967. She was the third among four siblings. Growing up, Lori cherished her friends and family as much as they cherished her. Attending Gunderson High School in San Jose, California, Lori was a bright student who also participated in many sports. Her love for technology put her ahead of her time. Eventually, Lori would go on to earn a well-established engineering position in one of the largest tech companies, Adobe Systems. Soon, she moved to Silicon Valley and was living in an apartment on Charleston Road in Santa Clara County. She reportedly also had a loving relationship with her boyfriend, who has never been named. On September 5, 1992, Lori left for work, but she never arrived there. On the same day, during his regular run, a jogger made a gruesome discovery on the 1300 block of Crittenden in Mountain View, now the site of Google's campus. A woman was found dead in the passenger seat of her car near a garbage dump. Authorities were notified about the discovery, and they identified the woman as 25-year-old Lori Houts. A nylon rope was still around her neck, which suggested she had been strangled to death. The crime scene did not hold many clues for investigators. Latent footprints were found both inside and outside of her car. Lori's footprints were found on the dashboard, indicating that a struggle had occurred. However, it was not a robbery. Her wallet was found nearby, undisturbed. Lori was found just two miles away from her workplace. Initially, investigators focused on the boyfriend as an obvious suspect, Yet, he was ruled out later when his fingerprints did not match the fingerprints found on Lori's car. However, the prints matched another person who was close to him, his roommate, John Kevin Woodwards. John was someone who could absolutely have been the assailant. Not only were his fingerprints in Lori's car, but he had a possible motive too. Allegedly, John was not a fan of Lori. He was somewhat jealous of her as he had growing romantic feelings towards his roommate, her boyfriend. Besides that, Lori's success in the tech world, a place that was dominated by males in the 90s, was something else that irked him greatly. When Lori's boyfriend asked him if he killed Lori, he did not give him a straight answer. Instead, he asked what information the investigators had. This behavior was both strange and suspicious. A month after the killing, John Woodwards was arrested for murder. At the 1995 trial, John's defense claimed that he had inadvertently left fingerprints on Lori's car because it was parked in front of his house some days before the murder. Prosecutors could not place him inside the vehicle. The first trial resulted in a hung jury. A second trial was held in 1996 but also resulted in a hung jury and was declared a mistrial. A judge dismissed the charges, saying he could not be charged again without new evidence. After the second trial, John moved to the Netherlands. Despite the possible suspect and developments made in the case early on, this case went cold. However, the investigation remained open. 30 years later, detectives successfully connected John Woodward's now 58 and a software firm CEO, to Lori Houts's murder. With the help of new DNA technology, they were able to extract new evidence from the original crime scene and compare it with John's DNA. His DNA matched the DNA found on the rope tied around Lori's neck. In July 2022, after police received a tip that John was heading back to the U.S., they caught him at JFK Airport after he landed. He was arrested in New York, where he's currently being held pending extradition to California. If found guilty, he's facing life in prison. The family stated after the arrest that this is not a win because they still don't get to have their sister back, but they're hopeful that they will finally get some justice for her. Susan Winters Susan Arlene Winters was born on March 14, 1966, to Danny and Avis Winters in Oklahoma. Her parents and older brother Christopher adored her from the day she was born. 
1984, Susan was phenomenal in both studies and sports. She led her high school softball team to the state championship. She kept running and won her age bracket in marathons. She went on to study law after obtaining a graduate degree in political science from Oklahoma University. Her career flourished from the start. She worked for a year in the Clark County District Attorney's Office, toiled at a Las Vegas law firm, and sometimes filled in as a judge in North Las Vegas Justice Court. While Susan succeeded well in her career, it was time for her to start a family. She married Brent Dennis in August 1995, a psychologist by profession. Their first daughter, Avis L., was born four years later in October 1999. The family welcomed a second daughter, Anna Danielle, in April 2002. Susan was passionate about every aspect of her life. She was an avid reader, a marathon runner, an animal lover, and a devoted mother and wife. Despite being a hard-working attorney at her workplace, she dedicated all her free time to her family. It would all change on January 3, 2015. At 6.48 a.m. that day, Susan's husband, Brent Dennis, called 911 after finding his 48-year-old wife unresponsive in bed. Paramedics quickly arrived to find Susan holding on to life, and she was taken to the hospital. Unfortunately, at 2.26 p.m., Susan passed away after Dennis instructed doctors to take his wife off life support. According to Dennis, his wife committed suicide. He claimed he found two bottles of antifreeze in the garage and assumed that Susan had drunk the antifreeze at some point. When asked why his wife committed suicide, Dennis told police that he and Susan had been fighting for quite some time. Susan was drinking while on antidepressant medication for depression and threatened to kill herself many times. Dennis also claimed he slept the entire night and woke up to find Susan unresponsive. According to the coroner's report, Susan died of a combination of ethylene glycol poisoning and oxycodone intoxication. Ethylene glycol is the main ingredient in antifreeze, so her death has been ruled a suicide. However, the strangest thing in this case was that no evidence in the bedroom showed Susan harmed herself. Detectives found no suicide note, no glass with antifreeze remnants of liquid in it, and no prescription bottles or antifreeze containers, an impossible scenario regarding the probability of suicide. Although Susan's death was already deemed a suicide and the case was closed, the Winters family was not ready to accept that she chose to take her own life. In 2016, Susan's parents, Danny and Avis Winters, hired retired FBI detective and attorney Tony Sergo, who filed a civil lawsuit against Brent Dennis on their behalf. Apparently, the suit alleges that Susan died under suspicious circumstances and blames her demise on Dennis, who had a financial motive. Indeed, Dennis was very keen on the financial benefit that originated from his wife's death. He stood to benefit from a $1 million life insurance policy taken out on Susan's life. He was also the beneficiary of Susan's inheritance worth $1 million. Within two days of his wife's death, he was in talks with the insurance company. Apart from monetary benefits, Brent Dennis had a much darker secret. The more Sergo dug deeper, the more Dennis looked like a suspect. Sergo found many clues that have never been looked at before. Clues that paint another picture of this respected Nevada psychologist. In his own investigation, Detective Sergo discovered significant evidence against Dennis, including a substance abuse addiction and a connection to a man named Jeffrey Crosby, who had a past conviction of selling cocaine. During his civil deposition, Dennis admitted to buying drugs from Crosby, what was the mechanism through which he would purchase uh, controlled substances from Jeffrey? Pay him cash and he would provide me substance. When the secret was out, Susan was mad. The situation deteriorated in such a way that Dennis had to seek treatment for his drug abuse. Phone records showed six calls and texts from Susan's phone to Crosby's phone in the days before her death. She allegedly called Crosby to inform him she was going to the authorities. Susan wanted her husband to stop using drugs. 
but the addiction did not stop there. It was revealed that Susan had previously threatened to report his alleged drug use to authorities. Cell phone records obtained by the family lawyers showed she called and sent text messages to Crosby several times in the days before her death to stop him from selling drugs to Dennis. Interestingly enough, she confided in some friends that her marriage was falling apart the day before she died. Avis and Danny insisted Susan did not kill herself. According to her parents, she was a bit upset, but in no way did that lead to her committing suicide. In fact, Susan purchased airline tickets to San Jose, California, Atlanta, and Hawaii to attend her daughter Anna's cheerleading competitions. Susan's parents said she was really excited that Anna would be attending college. Dennis had previously claimed that Susan had searched for antifreeze several times before her death, which made him believe that she took her own life by consuming antifreeze. But months later, investigators discovered that the last of the searches for antifreeze poisoning was done at 5.15 a.m., when Susan was already unconscious and nearly dead. Dennis also traveled to Orleans to meet with Crosby on four occasions after her death between January 9, 2015 and March 27, 2015. After consistent insistence from the Winter family and with newfound clues, detectives decided to revisit the case. In February 2017, during a traffic stop near his home, Dennis was arrested on suspicion of open murder with a deadly weapon. Allegedly, he received prescription painkillers from his own patients. Interestingly, even at the time of his arrest, he had three painkiller pills in his right pocket. He was formally charged with voluntary manslaughter after being taken into custody. In April 2017, Susan's manner of death was changed from suicide to undetermined following Dennis's arrest. While Dennis remained free on $250,000 bail, he entered an Alford plea in which he does not admit guilt, but concedes that prosecutors have sufficient evidence to prove his guilt. Four years after Susan's tragic demise, Dennis was finally sentenced to serve three to ten years in prison for voluntary manslaughter in connection with the 2015 death of his wife. While the Winters family is relieved by the outcome, Susan's daughters, who are now 22 and 20 years old, stood by their father. In a statement in court, they wrote that their father only entered the Alford plea in the case to avoid the harsher punishment, but had nothing to do with their mother's death. Whatever the outcome is, Susan's parents expressed their grief over losing contact with their granddaughters. While Susan is never coming back, hopefully the two families can find their way back to each other through the healing process. Patricia Stichler Patricia Ann Stichler was born on June 5, 1954, in Toledo, Ohio. She went by the name Patty to her loved ones and friends. In 1985, after having a divorce just a year earlier, 30-year-old Patty was a mother to three daughters, whom she lived with on the 5,000 blocks of Brinthaven Road in Sylvania, Ohio. Her eldest daughter, Andrea, was 11. Middle daughter, Kristen, was 9 and the youngest, Elise, was just five years old at the time. By all accounts, they were growing up in a safe neighborhood. Patricia was the first female manager of the 21st Century Health Spas and worked there for more than seven years. It was New Year's Eve. After dinner, Patty had put her three young daughters in bed when multiple calls came in. When Patty would pick up the phone, the person on the other end kept hanging up. This happened several times that night. When Andrea woke up the next morning, she could not find her mother. That is, until she came to the hallway and witnessed a horrific scene. Her mother's lifeless body was lying on the floor in a pool of blood. She was mostly nude. Panicking, she called her father, who then called the police. As police went to the scene, they found Patty's throat had been brutally slashed with many other injuries on her body. Investigators would not find signs of forced entry on any doors or windows, but there were knife cuts on the shower curtain and window coverings in the bathroom where a window was found open. Blood splatters were discovered on the walls of two rooms. Blood was also found on the bed and the carpets. 
a DNA sample was collected from the scene. The most shocking part was that while Patty was being attacked, her three daughters slept just a few feet away in another bedroom, but they were left unharmed. An autopsy revealed that the young woman put up a brave fight, which led to the wounds on her hands and arm, but she was no match to the intruder who had a knife in hand and inflicted 19 stab wounds upon her. A few stab wounds to her abdomen were caused after she was dead. Investigators believe the assailant broke into the house through the bathroom window. She was most likely being watched before the attack, but they could not determine whether the assailant previously knew her or not. An unknown male DNA profile was developed from the evidence collected at the crime scene. Both Patricia's ex-husband and her boyfriend at the time were investigated extensively and ruled out early on in the investigation. Patricia's daughters swore to do everything in their power to bring justice to their mother. Through the years, they actively worked with the investigators in the case, which went cold pretty much after the first year of the murder. Andrea does not have a recollection of the fateful day due to the extreme trauma she went through after finding her mother in that state. When Rich Schnorr became the chief of the Sylvania City Police Department, he prioritized the Patricia Stichler case because this was the only unsolved homicide in the city. Among the three homicides that occurred in the town, the other two were solved pretty quickly. In 2018, a genetic genealogist built a family tree of the suspect from the DNA that was preserved for all these years and came up with some distant relatives, which then led to a biological mother. But she had given up the suspect for adoption, so the genealogists had to trace even further. Finally, all of their hard work would pay off, and the suspect was identified as Michael Mellis. Michael was just 17 years old at the time of the murder and lived only six houses down from Patty. He joined the army after graduating from high school, while his family left the community shortly after the murder, as did Patty's. Although he was so close, investigators never had him on the radar for Patty's murder. Patricia's family was shocked to hear this news. Finally, they had the closure they'd wanted for so long. The pain was irreversible for Patty's daughters, but they finally knew who took their mother from them after 37 long years of uncertainty. However, it was bittersweet, as Michael could not be brought to justice. As it turned out, in 1989, just four years after Patty's murder, Michael would die in a single-car road accident while stationed in North Carolina. Despite this, Patty's middle daughter, Kristen, now 46, has a sense of peace knowing who killed her mother and that he can no longer hurt anyone. Lindy Sue Beechler. Lindy Sue Little was born on January 31, 1956. Lindy's parents separated when she was young and she stayed with her mother. Her father remarried and had a little boy named Mike. Lindy and Mike were very close and he has remained a steadfast advocate of his half-sister for over 35 years. Lindy and Philip Beechler were high school sweethearts. In October 1974, the couple got married and Lindy officially became Lindy Sue Beechler. While attending college, Philip worked at a car rental store and Lindy worked at a flower shop. They moved to a first floor manor township apartment in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Everything seemed to be going fine, but Lindy could not shake the feeling that someone was watching her. She confided in her family that she felt very uncomfortable in that apartment. One time, she even saw someone peeking inside her room through the glass sliding door. On December 5, 1975, between 6.45 p.m. and 7.05 p.m., Lindy returned home from the grocery store. Around 8.45 p.m., Lindy's uncle and aunt dropped by her Manor Township apartment. When they entered the apartment, they discovered blood on the front door the entranceway wall, and the carpet. Inside, Lindy was lying on her back, covered in blood, with a knife sticking out of her neck. Panic-stricken, they called the police immediately. When investigators reached the scene, they found blood all over the floor. They noticed the signs that a struggle had taken place. A butcher's knife was still stuck in Lindy's neck. The knife handle was wrapped with a tea towel. 
Interestingly, it matched the set of blades located in Lindy's kitchen. Traces of unknown DNA were collected from semen on Lindy's underwear and her pantyhose. Her body was then taken for autopsy. The autopsy report revealed that Lindy had been brutally stabbed a total of 19 times with two different knives. She had also been sexually assaulted. Police believe that the fatal wound came early on in the attack, yet the killer kept stabbing her. This is known as overkill and is usually associated with very high emotions during an attack. There was no indication of forced entry and no evidence of a robbery. Despite a bloody footprint at the scene, for a long time there was no new development in the case. Neighbors were questioned, but were not present at the time of the murder and could not provide any additional information. Police initially suspected Lindy's husband, but he was later ruled out. Around the one-year anniversary of her death, Lindy's grave was defaced with red paint and chips to the gravestone from a sharp object. A letter soon followed claiming responsibility for both the vandalism and the murder. Police later determined that this was a hoax. In 1997, a DNA profile was developed. In 2000, it was uploaded to the CODIS database, but no match was found and the case remained closed. Then, in January 2019, Manor Township Police Department handed the case over to the Lancaster County District Attorney's Cold Case Unit, which was formed in the same year. In June 2019, the unit reached out to Parabon Nanolabs to use their Snapshot Advanced DNA Analysis Service to analyze the DNA found at the crime scene. In September 2019, the investigators released two different composites developed by Parabon based on the DNA evidence. These composites helped in sketching the suspect's appearance, including skin tone, eye color, and hair color. The images show the killer at two different ages and how he would have changed over the years, from 25 to 65. In 2020, C.C. Moore, the chief genetic genealogist at Parabon Nanolabs, began digging deeper into the case by using genetic genealogy, which uses an unknown suspect's DNA to trace his or her family tree. She did not get a match right away. However, she was able to find very distant relatives. After months and months of scouring through documents, she was able to identify a suspect. It turned out that the suspect was hiding in plain sight all these years, and no one had a clue. It was David Sinopoli, a neighbor of Lindy who, at the time of her murder, lived in the same apartment complex. Yet police still needed to obtain a sample of his DNA to make an arrest. In February 2022, investigators tailed Sinopoli and recovered a coffee cup he had used and had thrown away at the Philadelphia International Airport. Reports from the labs later confirmed the DNA on Sinopoli's cup and DNA collected from the semen on Beechler's underwear and pantyhose were a match. Just as in Nancy Benelak's case, the motive for the horrific murder remains unclear, and the only connection between the two was the apartment complex they both lived in. In July 2022, 68-year-old Sinopoli was arrested and charged with Lindy's murder. He's currently being held without bail at the Lancaster County Prison. It's a relief to all that with the help of genealogy, Lancaster's oldest cold case has finally been solved. Stephanie Hebert on June 30th, 1972, Donald and Joyce Hebert were blessed with a beautiful baby girl. They named their daughter Stephanie Lynn Hebert. The middle-class family lived in a suburban neighborhood along the Mississippi River in Wagaman, Louisiana. In May of 1978, Stephanie graduated from kindergarten at Live Oak Manor Elementary School. Shortly after that, schools were dismissed for summer break. Kids were riding bikes back and forth from their homes to friends' homes, to convenience stores to buy treats, to explore wherever their little feet could pedal to, so long as they were back home when the streetlights came on, as was a common rule in those innocent times. Days before her sixth birthday, on June 13, 1978, Stephanie checked into her house to grab lunch. She had spent the previous night at her friend Lizzie's home. Around 2.30 p.m., after having a bite to eat, 
She again left her home to go to the house of another friend, Lori, who lived just a few doors away. As it was a safe community, she went alone. This was the last time anybody saw Stephanie. She never made it to her friend's house. Authorities were notified, and they immediately started searching for the little girl with blonde hair, blue eyes, and baby blue-rimmed glasses. More than 100 deputies and 50 volunteers relentlessly searched for Stephanie on foot through the dense woods and swampy areas surrounding the subdivision. Helicopters were also flown over those woods to scan the whole area. They even called for heavy equipment to help give searchers access to areas covered in underbrush and vegetation. Her mother, Joyce, was quoted as saying during the search, This is hell. I wouldn't wish this on anyone. Not even the devil. Initially, it was believed that Stephanie simply walked away and got lost on her own. But when she was not found after 72 hours of extensive searching, it was concluded that there had been a kidnapping. A single lead developed during the search. A local ice cream truck vendor said between 4.30 and 5.00 p.m. on the same day Stephanie disappeared, he sold two sticks of cotton candy to a girl that looked like her, accompanied by a woman wearing heavy makeup. Around 5.30 p.m., an eight-year-old neighbor boy had also seen Stephanie with a woman of similar description about four blocks from the Hebert home. However, no such woman could be found even after a thorough search, and the lead fizzled out. As the days passed into months, the chances of getting her back alive were slim. All efforts fell short. Sadly, five months later, on the week before Thanksgiving, a hunter made an awful discovery. About 20 miles away from her home, in a remote wooded area of St. Charles Parish, a tiny skeleton was found tied to a willow tree with a rope. Her glasses, shoes, and clothing were scattered nearby, except for her underwear. The remains were identified as five-year-old Stephanie Hebert. Although an exact cause of death could not be determined, investigators believed she was still alive when she was left there to be eaten by creatures and consumed by the elements. As little Stephanie was laid to rest, investigators could not fathom what kind of monster could be capable of committing this horrendous crime. There were several suspects throughout the years, but none could be prosecuted due to the lack of solid evidence. The case soon turned cold. In 2012, a courageous victim came forward with some truly shocking information about her own sexual assault back in 1979. After the revelation, Daniel Parks emerged as a new suspect in Stephanie's murder. Daniel Parks lived only eight houses down from where Stephanie lived when she was murdered. He raped a then seven-year-old local girl around the same time as Stephanie's disappearance. This was the same girl who came forward with the information in 2012. The girl was friends with Stephanie and remembered Parks threatening her, saying that she might end up like Stephanie. In the police interrogation, Parks confessed to the rape as well as the comment about Stephanie, but later recanted his confession. He maintained that he had incorrectly implicated himself in the crime due to his condition of diabetes. He was found guilty of two counts of aggravated rape and was sentenced to life in prison. He remained the suspect of Stephanie's murder for many years, but was never charged with her murder. Authorities set their sights on another suspect after Jason Franklin Jr., 50, referred to as Jay, came forward in 2012 to reveal the sexual and physical abuse he suffered at his own father's hands. His father, Jason Franklin Sr., was a resident of the same community as Stephanie in 1978. Jay went on to divulge an even more disturbing story from his childhood. He claimed that both of his parents were involved in Stephanie's abduction and that he, at six years old, was not only a witness, but was used as bait to lure the young girl in. Jay told the investigators that his father, Jason Franklin Sr., was a serial predator of young children, and sometimes he was forced to watch and even take part in the abuse. According to Jay, Stephanie was one of those victims. Jay claimed that Jason raped Stephanie on three separate occasions before her murder. Jay also revealed that it was Joyce Vinay, his mother, 
who abducted Stephanie Hebert and brought her to her ex-husband, Jason Franklin Sr. Though the two were divorced, Vinay still loved Jason Franklin Sr. and would often help in his husband's sick activities. On June 13, 1978, Vinay lured Stephanie into their car and drove her to a house in Luling, where Jason was waiting. At some point, Jason put Stephanie into a car and told his former wife to follow. They drove to the swampy area where Stephanie's body would later be found. Jason stripped Stephanie of her clothes and took Polaroid photos while forcing Jay to pose with her. On previous occasions, Stephanie had kept her mouth shut about the abuse, but Vinay argued with Jason about whether this might be a step too far. Stephanie threatened to tell her father this time. Jay recalled her tearful declaration, I am telling daddy a comment that perhaps sealed her fate. Jason witnessed his father straddling Stephanie, tying her to the tree, as they pulled away. He even led investigators to the exact area where Stephanie had been found. When detectives confronted Vinay, she denied involvement and called her son a liar. Despite Jay Franklin's testimony, it still took authorities years to prepare a case due to a lack of physical evidence. They had to determine whether the testimony was admissible and what charges Jason would be eligible for. In 2018, Jason Franklin Sr., 76, was finally arrested and charged with Stephanie's murder. Unfortunately, Joyce has never been charged due to a lack of evidence. Donald and Joyce Hebert lived long enough to see Jason Franklin Sr. arrested. Although they both died in 2020, Hopefully, they died in peace knowing their daughter's killer had been put away. However, the case was abruptly halted in January 2022 after Jason died of a respiratory illness while in prison. The investigation of this 44-year-old cold case was officially closed after Jay Franklin, the main witness, was killed by an alleged drunk driver in June 2022. Barbara Jepson Barbara Jean Jepson a newly married 18-year-old started her new life with her husband, Joe Jepson, in a lovely home in Van Nuys, California. As a National Air Guard, Joe earned a good living. So it's not a surprise that they planned to extend their family soon after marriage. They married in 1955, and Barbara conceived her first child that same year. By January of 1956, Barbara was in her fourth month of pregnancy. January 31, 1956 was a normal day when Joe left his home for work early in the morning. Feeling bored at home, Barbara went shopping later in the day. Locals saw her around 12.30 p.m. She returned home soon after. When Joe returned home from work, a bloody scene awaited him. In the bedroom, Joe discovered Barbara's naked body on the mattress with a 10-inch butcher's knife stuck in her chest. Joe covered his wife with a blanket and then called the police. As detectives reached the crime scene, they found several items of evidence. A military green jacket with blood traces was found a few feet away from Barbara's body. Some hair follicles from an unknown person were also found in the garage. However, important items such as bed sheets, pillow covers, and a bloody rug found in the sink were not collected since DNA technology was not available back then. The body was sent for examination, and reports came back stating that she'd been killed sometime between 1 p.m. and 4 p.m. It was also mentioned that she had been sexually assaulted before being brutally stabbed to death. The crime scene showed no forced entry, no stolen items, nor any signs of struggle, which led investigators to believe that she might have known her attacker. Upon questioning neighbors, two witnesses came forward. One person said he saw a person who did not live in the community roaming around the area that day wearing a green jacket. Another witness saw a man with big hands and big knuckles. Barbara was considered another victim of a series of sexual assaults that were going on in the nearby area. Police questioned every person who had committed crimes like this in the area, but could not link anyone to Barbara's murder. They initially suspected her husband, Joe, but he was eventually ruled out, as it was proven that he was at work during the murder. With no suspects, detectives reached a dead end. 
Despite combing through the evidence over the years, the search for Barbara's killer would remain unsolved and her case would remain cold. In 2016, DNA testing was completed on multiple items collected from the crime scene, but there was not enough DNA to submit the findings to the CODIS system for a match. Moreover, the suspect's DNA had most likely never been entered into the CODIS system. By 2019, Los Angeles police detective Rachel Evans had joined the cold case unit. The very first case assigned to her was Barbara Jepson's case. She set off re-examining the leads and looking for clues to identify the killer, which no detectives had been successful in doing for the past 60 years. It took her a whole week to read the entire case file the first time, yet she kept reading it again and again. By the third time, she picked up on a few things that had not been given much importance by previous investigators. She noted the fact that there was no sign of forced entry, which suggested that Barbara most likely knew her killer. No items were taken from the scene, pointing towards the motive not being robbery. Based on the assumption that Barbara knew her assailant, Evans started putting the pieces together and focused her investigation on one person, Monty Mertz. Born in 1911 in Utah, Mertz had several relationships over the years. He first got married to Cleo Rehm in 1931, with whom he had one son and one daughter, but that marriage fell apart. After the divorce, he married another woman named Bernice, but that marriage also did not last long. In 1945, during the divorce, Bernice cited cruelty as a cause. Indeed, Mertz was a violent person. He was also a gambling addict, womanizer, animal torturer, and a raging alcoholic, an absolute degenerate to say the least. And yet, women kept falling for him. In 1948, he moved in with a woman named Fern Spiva in the San Fernando Valley after making her his common-law wife. He stayed with her for six years. Spiva had a 10-year-old daughter from a prior relationship, that daughter was Barbara. Evans believed he groomed and molested Barbara along the way because that was one of his sick habits. He'd marry these young women who had young girls and then abuse them. In 1955, the year that Barbara got married, Mertz married another woman, his fourth wife who already had two children, including a young daughter. In 1960, 15-year-old Marianne Perdrada who had a horse stable next to Mertz's house and often rode horses with him, was stabbed nine times and killed. But no one was linked to the murder. Then, in 1962, Mertz married his fifth wife, Ina. She, too, had a young daughter. In 1964, Mertz was arrested for molesting a 14-year-old girl. Although Mertz was suspected of multiple sexual assaults, that was the only victim for which he was arrested. That same year, Mertz showed up at a hospital with a gunshot wound. He claimed he was injured in an accidental shooting, but others believed someone intentionally shot him. Although investigators never discovered who shot Mertz and why, people around Mertz believed that it was most likely from a confrontation regarding Mertz's past abusive behavior, as well as the possible connection to the murders of Barbara Jean Jepson and Marianne Perdrada. In 1965, after his arrest for child abuse, Mertz was given a polygraph test by police who asked him about both the murders of Barbara Jepson and Marianne Perdrada. He denied ever knowing Barbara, but later it was discovered that he had attended her funeral and often visited her mom even after Barbara's death. Evans said the polygraph test results concluded that Mertz had definite guilty knowledge regarding the fate of the two murdered women. But Mertz could not be prosecuted with this alone as polygraph test results are not admissible evidence in court. However, after this, suspicion mounted, and people started to notice that there was something wrong with him. One of the people who had suspected him was his own wife, Ina. She found the underwear of a young girl in a drawer in their house. On August 15, 1965, while he was out of jail, she confronted Mertz about whether he had been abusing the girl whose underwear he had. Suspicions already looming over him. This confrontation was the last straw as Mertz then grabbed a gun and chased Ina outside to the street, 
shooting her multiple times and killing her. Afterwards, he returned to the house and killed himself. This murder-suicide would be the last depraved act in his pathetic criminal life. It was revealed that in 2017, a former stepdaughter of Mertz came forward to tell a shocking story. On the day that 15-year-old Perdrada was murdered, the then 10-year-old girl saw Mertz come back into the house with a bloody knife and blood on his hands and clothing. She was so terrified of Mertz that she waited 50 years to come forward with this information. Mertz apparently abused the girl physically and mentally by doing such things as stabbing her horse with a pitchfork. Despite being in her 60s, she said that the memories of Mertz still haunt her and she's still afraid of him. Upon more digging, Evans learned that Mertz had a pattern of never leaving his victims alone, even after he remarried or when his stepdaughters grew up and moved out of the house. He would continue to abuse and sexually assault them until the time of his death. After some tiring research, Evans was able to track down Mertz's relatives still living in Utah. In September 2019, a search warrant for DNA was served on Mertz's 87-year-old son. Before the warrant, detectives were considering exhuming Mertz's body, but they were hopeful that the case could be solved by collecting his son's DNA. The son died just two weeks after giving his DNA to the detectives. Although there was not enough DNA to present, there was enough of a match to allow the cold case to be solved as per the standards of law enforcement with 99% certainty that Mertz was Barbara's killer. He was also suspected of other murders and assaults. Evans said he would be charged with first-degree murder if he were still alive. Although many of the people directly affected by this tragic murder have long since passed, Karen Stitt. Four decades ago, on September 2nd, 1982, after spending the entire evening with her boyfriend in Sunnyvale, California, 15-year-old Karen Stitt went to catch a late-night bus back to her home in Palo Alto. Her boyfriend David could not accompany her the entire distance out of fear that his parents would be upset with them for staying out past curfew. After dropping her off in the El Camino Real and Wolf Road area, David left. From there, Karen walked toward the bus stop. David had no idea that it was the last time he would see her. The next day, a delivery man witnessed a horrific scene roughly 100 yards away from the bus stop and called the Sunnyvale Department of Public Safety to report it. He found the naked body of Karen Stitt, whose arms and feet were bound by her own clothing. The brutally assaulted body was concealed behind a blood-stained wall near the now-gone Honeybee restaurant. Closer inspection of the crime scene showed that the leaves and dirt around her feet had been disturbed suggesting that she was still alive when her body was left there. Investigators believed that the murder was committed while the perpetrator was attempting a kidnapping. Detectives were shocked to witness the viciousness of the crime. After identifying the body and contacting the family, the corpse was taken to the medical examiner's office. The autopsy revealed that the 15-year-old girl had been sexually assaulted and fatally stabbed more than 60 times. Multiple stab wounds were found on her neck and chest areas. Although nobody knew who could have committed such a heinous crime, the murderer himself left his mark in the form of bodily fluids on Karen's body. During the initial investigation, David, the boyfriend, was a suspect, but he was quickly ruled out by DNA evidence. Investigators also came across a possible witness a machinist who saw a suspicious old-fashioned truck parked with its parking lights on near the area where Karen's body was later found. Although detectives urged the public to come forward if they had information about Karen's murder or the truck, their search remained fruitless. They investigated other possible leads, but nothing ever came of those either. Sadly, days turned into months, and months turned into years still with no significant developments made in the case. In 2000, a DNA profile was created from the DNA obtained as physical evidence at the crime scene and run through CODIS, the FBI's national database, but there were no matches. Amazingly, a valuable tip regarding Karen's murder came in after almost 40 years of silence. In 2021, 
Detective Matt Hutchison received a tip that pointed to one of four brothers from Fresno, California as the murderer of Karen Stitt. Hutchison reopened the case and started his own investigation. By April of 2022, Detective Hutchison, using genetic genealogy, had ruled out all of the brothers except one. He zeroed in on 75-year-old Gary Ramirez. Detectives did not have access to Gary's DNA, as by then he was living in Hawaii. However, they were able to obtain a DNA sample from his child. In early 2022, the sample was sent to the lab for DNA analysis. The result identified Gary as the likely source of the DNA obtained from the crime scene. Detectives believe Gary kidnapped Karen from the Sunnyvale bus stop and then brutally raped and killed her before dumping her bloodied body nearby. Gary, a former bug exterminator, had no criminal history, which is why his DNA was not present in the CODIS database. On August 2, 2022, Gary Ramirez was taken into custody and charged with Karen Stitt's murder from his home in Maui, Hawaii. The date of his first court appearance is pending. If found guilty, he could face up to life in prison without the possibility of parole. After 40 years of uncertainty, Karen Stitt's family finally got the answers they had desperately wanted for so long. Tana Togstad and Timothy Mumbrew Tana M. Togstad was born on August 20, 1968, in New London, Wisconsin. Tana had one older sister, Veronica, and one older brother, Richard. Two years after Tana's birth, a younger brother, Jeffrey, was born. Unfortunately, their father, David, died in 1985. The family was distraught, but Tana did not let the sadness overcome her. In 1987, she graduated from New London Senior High School. After graduation, she started working as a machine operator at Cherney Company Incorporated in Wayawaga, Wisconsin. Although Tana loved her family, it was time to start her own life. In 1991, Tana, 23, started dating 35-year-old Timothy Mumbrew and moved out to a farmhouse on Butternut Ridge Road in Royalton in Wapaka County. Even after leaving home, Tana stayed close to her family. Veronica and her husband lived in a mobile home just next to Tana. Richard's house was only one and a half miles away from Tana's farmhouse, which she shared with Timothy and her dog. On March 20, 1992, Tana and Timothy enjoyed an evening at LD's Bar in Clintonville in Wapaka County. It was between 11.30 p.m. and midnight when they left the bar and headed home. As the dawn broke, around 4 a.m. on March 21, 1992, Veronica woke up to a noise and saw a suspicious truck backing out of her sister's driveway and heading west. However, she did not think much of it. The following day, Nobody heard anything from Tana and Timothy, so the authorities were called to do a welfare check at the farmhouse that the couple shared. On the afternoon of March 22, 1992, Wapaka County Sheriff's Office Detective Donald Berglund conducted the welfare, which ended in a grim discovery. Inside the bedroom, he found Tana Togstad, Timothy Mumbrew, and their dog. All three had been brutally stabbed to death. Numerous print impressions were discovered at the crime scene, some of them in the blood of the victims. However, no weapons were located at the scene. Both Tana and Timothy's families were devastated to hear the news. They stated that neither Tana nor Timothy had any enemies, and they had no idea who could have committed the atrocious act. The bodies were taken to the medical examiner's office for further inspection. After the autopsies were done, it was revealed that Timothy was stabbed multiple times while he tried to defend himself. He had numerous injuries on his neck, head, and chest, with various perforations of the heart and lungs. On the other hand, Tana died from a single stab wound to the chest that penetrated her left lung. The only physical evidence of the killer that police found was the bodily fluid found on Tana's body. However, when the DNA was tested, there was no match present in the criminal database. For years, authorities worked on potential leads, interviewed hundreds of people, and even took DNA samples from possible suspects, 
but nothing ever came of it, and the case eventually grew cold. In 2013, a person of interest was identified, a man named Glendon Gauker, who was already charged with the killing of a man and rape of his girlfriend in 1990. But he was never officially charged with Tana and Timothy's murder. As Tana and Timothy's families wondered about the culprit, without solid leads, the case turned cold. Over the years, there were many false leads that led nowhere. The case finally reopened after a DNA sample was obtained from a pen used by the suspect during a traffic stop on July 6, 2022. Forensic tests showed that it was a complete match to the DNA found on Tana Togstag's body. That man was 51-year-old Tony Haas, whom police had long suspected of the murder. Tony Haas was not a stranger to the Togstad family. Both families lived in the same community and knew each other well. However, he had a much deeper connection to the family. Haas was seven when his father died in a snowmobile accident. He was racing with two other snowmobiles when the crash killed him, and Tana's father was the driver of one of the other snowmobiles involved. On the night of the murder, Haas, 22 at the time, was drinking heavily and, for some reason, started thinking about his father's death 15 years earlier. According to his later statement, in a drunken stupor, he headed to the home of Tana Togstad. It is not clear what intention he had behind the decision, but Haas claimed he did not intend to hurt anyone. Unfortunately, the actions he took did not align with that. When Tony was taken in for questioning, he initially denied any connection to the crime. But as the interview went on, he revealed that on the night of the murder, he had been going from bar to bar, drinking heavily by himself. He said that afterwards, he got nervous when he saw the murder on the news, remembering the snippets from the previous night. He claimed that he was afraid he had been involved, but could not remember the events clearly due to his drunken state. According to what investigators were able to piece together from his statement, inside the farmhouse, he got into a fight with Timothy and fatally stabbed him with a knife. As Tana yelled, Tony punched her in the face and stabbed her in the chest, killing her. He again said he did not remember what happened that night clearly. When asked why he did not notify the authorities, he stated he did not want it to look like a planned attack. On August 12, 2022, Tony Haas was charged with first-degree premeditated murder and is currently being held on a bond of $2 million. Tana's brother, Richard, said he was happy the culprit had finally been found. He stated that, while he didn't know Haas personally, he knew his family and felt bad for them. Tana's mother, Helen, died at peace on August 14, 2022, after learning who was responsible for her daughter's untimely demise. Nancy Marie Benelak Nancy Marie Benelak was born in Nevada, California on June 13, 1942. After spending her childhood in Nevada, she moved to Sacramento and worked as a court reporter. In 1970, 28-year-old Nancy was living alone with her cat on the second story of an apartment complex on Bell Street in Sacramento. While working in Sacramento County Court, Nancy met and fell in love with Ferris Salome, Salome was chief public defender in the Sacramento District Court. They were engaged to be married, with the wedding scheduled for November 28, 1970. Just a month before the wedding, the couple spent their evening having fun before heading back to Nancy's apartment. Nancy quickly fell asleep, so Salome decided to go back to his home. At around 11.30 p.m., Salome left the apartment. Before leaving, he left the sliding glass door ajar so that Nancy's cat could come and go as it pleased in the night, which Nancy often did herself. He never imagined this simple act would put his fiancée in horrible danger. The next morning, on October 26, 1970, when Nancy did not show up for work, her co-workers grew concerned, as she never missed work. One of her co-workers sent her son to check up on Nancy. When no one opened the door, even after repeated knocks, he reached out to the building manager. Together, the building manager and the co-worker's son discovered a heinous crime scene after entering the apartment with a passkey. 
Nancy was lying dead in a pool of her own blood in her bed. She had been ruthlessly stabbed over 30 times. Defensive wounds on her arms indicated that she tried desperately to fight off the attacker. The assault was so savage that her head was nearly decapitated. Authorities were alerted and they arrived a few minutes later. Blood was everywhere, but no fingerprints were found inside the apartment, indicating that the murderer had probably concealed their fingers to avoid leaving fingerprints. A long blood trail was also discovered, which started from the second story balcony, continuing to the sidewalk below and around the apartment complex buildings which ended in the apartment complex parking lot. Investigators at that time believed that the attacker got into the apartment by climbing up to the balcony and then attacked and killed her. They surmised that the perpetrator must have gained access to the apartment by climbing up to the balcony and came in through the sliding glass door. They also theorized that this person had gotten injured during the attack, after which they climbed down. Based on the blood trail, the culprit would then have gotten into a vehicle in the complex parking lot and left. Nearly 500 people from the nearby area were questioned, but detectives had no suspects in their sights. Despite the efforts from law enforcement, the case grew cold. Although blood evidence was present there at the crime scene, it was not enough to apprehend the culprit. In the 70s, science was limited to the modern technology of 50 years ago and only a blood type could be determined from someone's blood, and that's about it. In 2004, a DNA profile was developed from the blood collected from the crime scene and was uploaded to the state and national CODIS databases, but no match was found. Then, after nearly 50 years, in November 2019, detectives from the Sacramento County Sheriff's Office re-examined the cold case using forensic genetic genealogy the same technology that was employed to identify the notorious Golden State Killer. The DNA profile was uploaded to a genealogy website to find possible suspects. Finally, on July 21, 2022, the murderer of Nancy Marie Benelak was identified as Richard John Davis. Richard John Davis was born on the 22nd of March, 1943. In 1970, 27-year-old Richard Davis lived in the same apartment complex as Nancy. While Nancy lived in apartment number 17, Davis lived in number 23. They were on opposite ends of a pool, and Nancy's apartment could be seen across the pool from Davis's apartment. Among the 500 people, both Davis and his roommate were interviewed by the sheriff's office during the initial investigation. However, each provided alibis for one another. Davis had no previous convictions except for a driving under the influence charge. So his DNA had never been uploaded to the CODIS database. No motive for the murder has been mentioned, but the murder did appear to be premeditated, according to investigators, due to the killer's choice of placing masking tape over his fingertips, which clearly indicated this was a premeditated attack. Nancy was not close to Davis. The only connection they could find between Davis and Nancy was the apartment complex they both lived in. However, investigators now believe that Davis stalked Nancy and was jealous about her getting married to a decent man weeks later. Apparently, this jealousy and rage are what motivated him to break into her apartment and kill her. The revelation was bittersweet to Nancy's family, as Davis died on November 2, 1997, at 54 years of age, due to complications from alcoholism. However, they were relieved to finally know who was responsible for Nancy's death. Nadine Madger In 1980, Mark and Nadine Madger were happily living with their infant son Daniel in the Willow Grove apartment building on Grove Avenue in Willoughby, Ohio. 25-year-old Nadine was a beautiful person inside and out. Standing at around 5 foot 2 inches tall and weighing around 110 pounds, Nadine had a beautiful smile that matched her brown hair and brown eyes. Nadine was a stay-at-home mom who enjoyed being a mother. She was very gentle in nature and prioritized her family over anything. The family of three was thriving after Daniel's birth when tragedy struck the Madger family. On January the 11th, 1980, 
Mark Madger returned home around 5 p.m. after a long day of work. He never imagined he would find a scene of sheer horror in his own apartment. He was shaken to his core to find his wife, Nadine, on the floor of the dining room. She had been stabbed more than 40 times with a butcher's knife that was still sticking out of her body. Their six-month-old son was just a few feet away, playing in a playpen, unharmed. Devastated, Mark then called 911 to report the horrific incident. When the Willoughby Police Department detectives observed the crime scene, they concluded that there was no forced entry. This was not even a robbery case because nothing was missing from the apartment. The knife, which was the murder weapon, belonged to the Madgers. Another knife was also missing from the set. After the corpse was taken to the medical examiner's office, the reports revealed that, although no sexual assault occurred, the attacker had stabbed Nadine 40 times, which looked like a crime of passion. In the initial investigation, it was believed that Nadine was murdered sometime between 1.15 p.m. and 4.45 p.m. Around the same time, a neighbor reported observing a canary yellow Dodge Dart parked in the rear of their apartment complex. Not many clues were left at the crime scene, but the killer did leave something behind. The blood on Nadine's shirt played the most crucial part in the later part of the investigation. The perpetrator's blood suggested only one thing. He was somehow injured in the attack and had bled. Some of the killer's blood on Nadine's shirt was in the form of perpendicular drops, which suggested that the suspect was standing on top of Nadine while he was bleeding. A DNA profile was developed from the attacker's blood collected from Nadine's shirt. Police had some suspects on their list, and any suspect on the initial list that they could track down was interviewed and compared to that DNA profile, but with no luck. Unfortunately, the case went cold for years. The case re-emerged in 2018 when the Willoughby Police Department started working with Virginia-based Parabon Nanolabs Incorporated a DNA technology company that specializes in identifying suspects through their ancestry using genetic genealogy. The lab entered the suspect's DNA into two databases, GEDmatch and Family Tree DNA. Once in those databases, it was compared to any registered user. Several matches were found, but were very distant cousins of the suspect. From there, they began to build a family tree of possible matches leading them to a man named Stephen Joseph Simkak. He was a former U.S. Marine and resided in New York with his wife. He had no criminal history throughout his life. Between 1963 and 2002, he was a resident of Sunset Drive in East Lake, Ohio. Around the time of Nadine's murder, Simkak worked for Lincoln Electric Department. During his 36 years working for that company, he had only called in sick once, in 1980, the very day Nadine was murdered. It was also noted that, in 1980, he drove a canary yellow Dodge Dart, identical to the one spotted near the scene the day of the murder. Investigators tracked down and contacted one of Simcac's adult children in 2022. The man had absolutely no clue what his dad had done in his past, but agreed to provide them with a DNA sample. The sample was analyzed by Parabon Nanolab. After extensive examination, they came to the conclusion that it was Simcac who indeed murdered Nadine Madger in 1980. It was conclusively determined that his DNA was the same DNA that was discovered on Nadine's shirt. It's not known why this heinous crime was committed. Investigators do not have any information on whether Simcac knew her or if it was a targeted killing. Unfortunately, all these questions will forever linger as Simcac passed away from natural causes in 2018. Nadine's husband, Mark Madger, said that he has nothing against the Simcac family, but wants them to understand what kind of a person Simcac really was. He was quoted as saying, If there's a hell, I know he's in it, and I hope he rots there. If there's a place in hell, I know he's in it, and I hope he rots there. Nadine's son, Daniel, now 42 years old, has also expressed anger because the culprit passed away as a free man without having to face justice. 
However, he's relieved that they can finally put a face and a name to his mother's killer.